Welcome to the Land Fire and California Fire Science Exchange webinar. I'm Jeannie Patton, Communications Lead for the Nature Conservancy's Land Fire Program. This is one of a series of webinars offered in partnership with the Fire Science Exchange Network that look at Land Fire's Biophysical Settings Review Project. Today is the third in our California series. Our fourth is happening on February 2nd when Corey Blankenship demystifies the biophysical settings review in California. Other regional presentations are also scheduled through the spring and now in the fall. The webinars are recorded and posted on both the California Fire Science and Land Fire YouTube channels. Landfire publicize webinars and other news via the bi-monthly bulletin, so if you do not subscribe yet, please do. The link to subscribe is on the last slide of this presentation. Today's presenter is Hugh Safford, U.S. Forest Service Ecologist for the Pacific Southwest Region and the Department of Environmental Science and Policy at UC Davis. He will lead you through the highlights of his work regarding management applications of Landfire BPS models in California. Yeah, I was asked to talk a little bit about how we've used the BPS models and models that were developed uh, based on the BPS model for uh, management applications in California, and I'm going to be talking primarily about some work that we've done in the Sierra Nevada. Um, and um, what I'm going to do, I'm going to talk about management uses of state and transition models and not just uh, about uh, the BPS system, although that'll be sort of the focus. And uh, BPS stands for biophysical settings, and these were state and transition models that were developed for all of the different ecosystems that land fire mapped in the early and mid 2000s. Um, you can find information on these on uh, the Landfire website, and I think that information is on the last slide. I know that there's actually a current review process going on for these models. It's actually a pretty important process, and I hope that some of you can get involved. But I'm going to provide some background on uh, just the development process, and I'm going to talk briefly about some of the limitations and assumptions uh, in the BPS models. And then hopefully the bulk of the presentation will involve some of the ways that we've used these models in management applications. So let's just start with some nuts and bolts stuff. So state and transition models are often called box and arrow diagrams. And so they represent ecosystem dynamics using boxes to represent sort of discrete ecosystem states. We might call them successional stages or serial stages, kind of things generally that you can actually recognize. And it's really useful if there are things you can recognize on the ground so you can actually tie this work to mapping or to spatial modeling. And then linking the boxes are arrows that represent transitions among those states. And those, those uh, transitions can be a variety of things. They can simply be successional patterns that are based on growth. Uh, they, can be, uh, they can represent even the competitive outcomes. They can represent things like disturbance. Um, these models are based on sort of the non-equilibrium ecological uh, paradigm, if you will. In other words, uh, Although there is, you, you can model into these things the effects of competition and other stuff, the models really are driven by allochthonous or external disturbances, and hence they tend not to, they don't follow this model of sort of biotic interactions leading an ecosystem over time through discrete, you know, successional stages where you get to some equilibrium long term. And one of the coolest things about these models is that you can incorporate a bunch of different successional pathways, lots of different states. Um, you can throw in threshold effects. There were all sorts of different kinds of reversible and irreversible transitions. And if you can do a good job of, of, of modeling or, 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 or generating a, a, a reasonable framework for the ecosystem you're modeling, there's a lot of unexpected outcomes that you can actually see within the models um, and the products that come out. So basically, landfire BPS models are a type of state and transition model. So we built uh, these things using uh, VDDT, which is the Vegetation Dynamics Development Tool. This was developed by ESSA Technologies, which is a Canadian outfit, um, which had uh, a lot of funds uh, and different sorts of MOUs with the Forest Service and some other federal agencies for many years. Uh, the, most of the ESSA tools are still available online for no charge. You can just go to their website and you can pick them up, and they keep getting better. So this is just a, an example. I've got a couple slide examples of some pretty simple state and transition models. This is actually a screenshot from an earlier version of VDDT, and I've thrown some pictures into the slide as well as um, some descriptive text. 
So each of the boxes represents some kind of definable or recognizable successional stage. We'll call those states. And then the lines with arrows between them are these transitions. Uh, and then the way I've organized it is that the two boxes at the top are defined as, uh, this is a forested system, and these are defined as trees that are between 5 and 25 inches uh, diameter. And the bottom line is trees that are greater than 25, stands dominated by trees greater than 25 inches diameter. And the two boxes in the middle are systems in which there either are no trees or the trees are less than 5 inches diameter. And then they're split from left to right as well, such, as, such that the late and middle serial uh, states on the left side are those which have a canopy cover less than 50% and the right side are those for more than 50%. And the reason I use these is these were pretty standard for, first of all, for the first uh, um, set of uh, BPS models that we developed in the early and mid-2000s, but they also uh, are easy to use because these represent cutoffs that are important to us in the Sierra Nevada with respect to the forest plans, the Sierra Nevada framework, and some of the constraints that we operate under. So that's another important thing, that when you define your states, that you make sure that they represent things that are meaningful to you, not just ecologically, but also in terms of a management context as well. Um, so this is, just, this is just spaghetti, obviously, and I'm not going to really talk about it, but I just wanted to note with respect to the states, and then I'm going to show another slide right after this that puts this in more of a tabular form. But this is where you really end up spending a lot of time. We, we built, uh, when this whole land fire process started, and this was done under the auspices of the FRCC fire regime and condition class modeling effort that was led by, by the Nature Conservancy primarily. And um, there were some pretty strict guidelines that I'll talk about later on. You could only have five states, and there were certain kinds of transitions you could model and others you couldn't. And we realized as we were uh, building simple models for the land fire program that there was a lot of things that we could do with these models that the BPS uh, uh, models were going to be a little bit too primitive for us to do that with. So we actually spent uh, good portions of a couple of years building a set of models for Ponderosa pine and Jeffrey pine, white fir mix conifer for a couple different red fir systems um, that were very common uh, in the central Sierra Nevada and for which we wanted to be able to apply to forest planning and forest management. Uh, activities. So uh, at any rate, all of these different lines are just, in some cases, in some models, they may actually be WAGs, but we spent a lot of time in, in forest vegetation simulators, in, uh, you know, in the literature, in using the, the plantation data that are available, uh, and just from our field experience as well to, to define these uh, successional pathways, how long it took for one state to move to another, under what conditions, what happened if you had you know, a stand replacing fire or a moderate severity fire or a, or a low severity fire, you know, how did insects and disease impact these things, et cetera. So I'm not going to spend any more time on this, but I just want to note that this is actually a very, very simple state and transition model. So this graphic is, this is also out of VDDT. This is, uh, again, from an earlier version. And this is just showing in, in that column where it says two class, the letters that have underlines on, uh, that are underlined are the actual state. And then underneath that are all the successional pathways that lead from that state to other places. And so it shows you the boxes they go to. Um, it gives you a code, but that, that has to do with how the model runs. It gives it a name. For example, state A succeeds to state B if nothing else happens. If you go across that line, you'll see that that'll happen after 54 years uh, on average. And then below that, you can have stand replacement fire, you can have mixed severity fire, you can have competition effects, and you can have what's called an alternate succession. And then to the right are some rule sets with respect to what the minimum age is before something like that can happen, what the maximum age is, what happens to the age of the stand if something like that happens. So, for example, if you've got a stand that's going to succeed in an average of 54, 55 years to some other a state, succeed to another state, you can actually uh, probabilistically force that, sta that state to remain uh, in that state rather than succeeding through this competition thing. And in, in this case, this is A is a chaparral stand in which conifers are essentially trying to break through it. And you can probabilistically force a state to remain in that. And uh, we know that 55 was an average. There are certainly stands out there where it can be more like 60, 70, or 80 years before you'll see a forest develop. 
Um, and then on the right-hand column, you'll see this thing called TSD, and that's time since disturbance. And what that allows you to do is to force a system to wait a little bit before it can have another disturbance. So, for example, if you have a, a low severity fire in a system, it's going to reduce fuel such that it would be unlikely that you would get another fire of that kind through the system uh, for, in this case, generally about 10 years. And those are what the data are, sh are showing us in, in uh, most of the mixed conifer kinds of forests. And so you can force the model to do that. At any rate, that's just an example of some of the things you can you can uh, engineer into the model. And, and uh, I had a couple of slides that I just actually took out uh, yesterday that talk about some of the bells and whistles you can add, and I may talk about those at the end. So basically, in terms of outputs, probably the most commonly used output is this simple summary of successional states over time. Uh, I forget I anymore exactly what the standards were for the development of the BPS models, whether it was a 500-year simulation or a 1,000-year simulation. But we would run these a whole lot of times, and then we would get mean outcomes. And uh, once the models were stable, once we'd had them reviewed, once we'd done some validation, and I'll talk a little bit about validation here in a minute, then these outcomes, in this case time step 1,000, that has five, they're calling them classes, but those are the states. This is giving you a hypothesis as to what proportion of a given landscape would have been occupied by these, these different states. And then that provided land fire the ability to compare current status of landscapes versus this sort of predicted pre-settlement outcome because these models were built under the assumption, uh, under the assumptions that you were working in a, in a, in a landscape dominated by pre-Euro-American settlement dynamics. So another output that's been very, very useful to people is, uh, uh, is the fire return interval output and also the vari variability therein. Um, the values actually come out as fire frequencies, and so to, uh, you have to divide them um, by 100 in order to turn them into fire return intervals. But basically, uh, this particular model had an average fire return interval for this run of 9.5 years. And the, the uh, variability you can see in that little yellow box on the top left uh, of the diagram was between, uh, let's see here, yeah, between 7.3 and 14.9 years. And that, that's uh, plus or minus a couple of standard deviations. So at any rate, that's for a particular model. And then uh, you can also look at the uh, post-fire landscape. It can give you ideas as to how much of the landscape burned at different levels of fire severity. And so in this case, I've, I've thrown on this graphic uh, more or less an elevational gradient from Jeffrey Pine through a couple different kinds of mixed conifer up into the red fir belt. Um, and you can see, again, there's, these are hypothetical distributions of proportional area of fires burning at low, moderate, and high severity fire. And then if, you're, if you include other disturbances, you can also look at these things. And for example, here we did incorporate some uh, information on insect and disease mortality. This was out of the Region 5 uh, data sets that have become, that have gotten so much press recently now uh, with all the mortality that we're seeing in the forest. Um, but what we found uh, from information that was summarized for us by the Forest Service uh, uh, pathologists and entomologists was that somewhere between about what was it, 0.4 and 1.2 percent mortality annually was sort of a, t a standard background rate. And so this model ends up right in there. And then there's about a 20 time, um, a, a very, the variability is about 20 times that across this, uh, the 500 year time span. Now I want to note that the models that I'm actually presenting here have climate variability in them. We built uh, climate streams based on the variability in the Palmer Drought Severity Index. Um, and that kind of variability actually was, is not built into the BPS model. So I want to note that the stuff you're seeing here has somewhat more variability than you would see in a typical BPS output. And then I don't think I'll spend any time on this, but this is just a tabular output of the kind of things that you can get out of them. Uh, you can see what, uh, for each of the, the serial stages or the states across the top, you can go down that. You can see the definitions. You can see the age uh, brackets, what the inferred dominance are, what the canopy cover is, uh, what the average size classes are. And then you can look at the probabilities for fire, how those translate into fire return intervals. And you can see that for each of the states, for each of the kinds of disturbance. Uh, and then you can, on the right-hand column, you can see you can generate, like for this model, 90% of all fire models was low severity, 7% mixed or moderate, and 3% was high. And then in the lower 
um, row, you can see the outcomes after uh, however many uh, 500 or 1,000 year intervals, and you can see that those different states had very different proportions on your average finishing landscape. And then finally, I'll just note that in column two, there's a thing called the drought multiplier, and that is not in the BPS models. And again, those are multipliers that we um, developed based on information we had on the relationship between drought and insect outbreaks in California. Okay, so then the last thing I'll cover before I get into the, the actual um, Uh, outputs is, I mean, uh, applications rather, is just some of the map model validation that we did. So we started building these models, uh, I think it was probably 2002, 2003, um, and uh, spent a lot of time on the five models that I talked to you about in validating them. Um, a lot of the BPS models had to be developed r under relatively quick timelines, and I will say that that's one of the things I'll talk about under limitations and assumptions, is you really need to know the model, you need to contact the people who developed it, and you need to understand the extent to which the models were, va were validated, because for certain vegetation types it was very difficult to validate them or to, to assess the accuracy. But in these five models, we spent a lot of time, uh, we spent years building them and then spent a lot of time validating them. And I'm just going to show you some examples. So this is uh, uh, for the models that we developed. Again, I think these are not uh, the BPS models themselves, but rather their progenitors, the, the six box and somewhat more complicated models that we built and then based the BPS models on. But you can see that the blue bars are the modeled fire return interval within the models and the uh, cream-colored bars are from a paper I published with Kip Vandewater in 2011. In other words, well after we had built the models that summarized all of the fire scar and other data available in the state on the, on the most likely pre-settlement fire return intervals for these types. And you can see that the model is very, very close. Uh, and then here is some validation for fire severity. And in this case, I'm using uh, for the Jeffrey Pine, what you've got is three areas. One is Jeffrey Pine model, and then uh, the actual current Jeffrey Pine fire severity spectrum from the Sierra de San Pedro Martir in northern Baja California, which was not logged and has only been getting fire suppression for the last few decades. Next to it is a mixed conifer model, and the same forest types from the Sierra de San Pedro Martir. And then on the right is the, our red fir, a, a composite of our two red fir models compared to information you can get from Lieberg's 1902 summary of fire severity patterns in the higher elevation forest in the northern Sierra Nevada. And again, you can see that the models really are, are quite close. And then finally, you can also look at things like structure. And so, well, you know, in, this is for the Lake Tahoe Basin because we use these models a lot in the Lake Tahoe Basin forest plan. And so what the left-hand graphic is uh, the data on the ratio of large versus medium plus small trees in the general land office data from the late 19th century from this model and then from uh, a paper by Alan Taylor in 2004, which necessarily undersampled small trees because it was essentially stump counting about a century after logging had happened. And of course, the smaller trees would have, would have uh, disintegrated by that time. And then you can look at, to the right, is the percent of the landscape dominated by different size classes, you know, at any rate. So this is just classic model building. You know, we're, we're, we're basically iteratively assessing accuracy and validation and then trying to change the internal model characteristics um, you to better reproduce uh, the dynamics that we see in the reference information. Okay, so just real quickly, some assumptions and limitations. It's real important that you understand that those outputs from the BPS models are only applicable to relatively large landscapes, not to forest stands. Um, so really, if you want to use these things and talk about, you know, wanting to get to some proportional distribution of different serial stages in the landscape, you can't be, in the Sierra Nevada, you can't be talking about landscapes less than about 10,000 acres. You just can't. Um, there are certain, uh, it, and this depends very much on the fire regime, the size of disturbances, and all that kind of stuff. Um, Secondly, you have to define these things really clearly ecologically, and it's really important to assign them the right parts of the management landscape because, you know, these models apply to potential veg types, right, not to the existing vegetation. Uh, and you can't, there aren't transitions between uh, BPSs. And so basically the point is, is that, you know, if you've got a soil type or a part of the landscape in which the model really doesn't apply, if you apply it there, you're going to get the wrong answers. 
Another thing that to think about is, you know, we're talking about state and transition models, so they're not spatially explicit, right? So they do not uh, deal very well. Well, that's not the right way to put it. They can't deal directly or explicitly with landscape dynamics, right? And as a result, the variability in the model runs can often be very low unless you incorporate drought multipliers, landscape multipliers, uh, things like time since disturbance and climate streams, which you couldn't actually do in the BPS models because of the limitations of the much larger model they plugged all those BPS models into uh, to get the land fire outputs. However, you can do this using the VDT, VDDT platform uh, basing model development on BPS. Um, so let's see here. And then, uh, and then the BPS models are really quite simple. I mean, you know, you look at a five box model with a whole lot of arrows and you think that's complicated, but really they're not. And the BPS modeling forced us to limit very much the number of states and the type of transitions. We couldn't use a lot of those multipliers that I talked about. And the time disturbance function was only, you could only use it to represent absence of disturbance, not absence of fuels. And then finally, uh, as I noted before, this is, these are potential types and they represent pre-Euro-American settlement reference conditions. And so it's, it can be pretty hard to actually validate the outcomes. And so that's why we spent so much time over that two-year period combing the literature, using information from contemporary reference uh, landscapes to validate that stuff. And the BPS models themselves don't include effects of management or climate change. That doesn't mean you can't grab these models, use them as a basis, and then modify them to be able to do that. It's actually not that hard if you know what you're doing. And, and some of the ex uh, examples I'm going to show do this kind of thing. Okay, so here's some outputs. So um, we used uh, those really highly validated uh, state and transition outputs uh, as uh, to provide desired conditions for uh, serial stage distributions on large landscapes in the Lake Tahoe Basin Management Plan. And um, so what you can see here is this is for the whole Lake Tahoe Basin, and we've got uh, four different forest types there. We've got reference conditions that we basically built off of the models. Then we have current conditions, and those are the proportions of landscapes occupied by those five different serial stages on the right. And it gives you an idea as to sort of what kinds of management would represent restoration if you're looking to represent vegetation structure in this landscape. And we also did this work on the scale of about uh, what, what, what scale watershed would this be? I guess it would be, what is that, 6th or 7th field or something like that? I forget. Whatever it is, sort of the 10 to 20 or 30,000 acre uh, landscape. Um, at any rate, so that's been used to an extent to sort of help to highlight landscapes that require this kind of work. Um, and then what this is, is we actually then went and did modeling using... Um, the fourth vegetation simulator and the region fives, I think we were using what they call spectrum, which is a spatial, essentially you can use FES data in this spatial model. And then we looked at, this is for, um, this is just for the Jeffrey Pine type, and on the left is the reference condition, in other words, what we had modeled for, for pre-Euro-American conditions. And then based on assumptions that the basin was going to be able to carry out about 1,200 acres per year of different kinds of treatment, we then modeled that to see how we were progressing towards replicating those conditions on the landscape. This kind of stuff I know has been done on a, on a, on a number of different forests, certainly in the western U.S. So an inter the outcome of this was basically progress was going to be slow, but you could make progress. This, this of course, didn't assume any wildfire or any other state-changing event. So another thing that we uh, recently did was uh, Jay Miller and I have a, have a paper right now uh, in, in uh, fire ecology. Actually, I wrote in press, but I should write in review. I'm assuming it's going to be uh, accepted, and I thought it would have been by now. I didn't change that. But basically, one of the things that we did is there, there are folks out there claiming that all of these really huge high-severity fires we're having are just totally normal, and we just need to leave the forest alone. And so we've been really interested in that, in that, in that hypothesis because uh, it, it just seems like it doesn't make sense based on the 95% of the information that we've been looking at for the last 20 years. So we back-engineered our BPS models. Start, the, the upper block A is run using the pre-settlement reference model, and the, right, the lower right graphic is run with a model that's based on the current proportions of fire severity in the average fire in the Sierra Nevada in uh, mixed conifer forests. And what you can see is when you run these things out a thousand years a bunch of times, that, 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 that reference model we built does a really good job of predicting the amount of uh, late serial forest that m most of the independent estimates uh, uh, suggest was out there. For example, the Franklin, 
and Fritz Kaufman estimate from Yosemite, or the Greeley statements from 1905 in the Sierra Nevada, they were all talking about somewhere between 45 and 60 percent of the, of the forest was dominated by large trees, and that's what our model produces. But if you have the same fire frequencies that went on in the early Sierra Nevada using today's uh, proportions of fire severity, you see that you can't maintain more than 10, you know, 12, 13 percent of the landscape in big trees. And when you read all of these tomes by, you know, all the folks who were, um, you know, marching around California in between the 1840s and early 1900s, including Sudworth and Lyberg and John Muir and Clarence King and, and Brewer and all these people, boy, the first thing you read about is how big the darn trees were everywhere. So at any rate, we use this as an example in a paper to suggest that we don't think that their claims hold any water. And then Another thing that gets used relatively often are the fire severity outputs. This is from uh, another thing that Jay Miller and I published a few years ago. This was the fire severity monitoring report for the Sierra Nevada. And we used the modeling outputs, they're called REF in the graphic, uh, to compare to the current proportions uh, or, or distributions of fire severity in these forest types. And basically, what you see is that for the lower and moderate elevation uh, forest types, there's a huge difference. There's a, a, a big surplus in stand replacing fire currently uh, in terms of your average fire, whereas when you get up into the red fir systems, there isn't that surplus. And, and that's something we're, we're glad to see because all of the other evidence we have as well is that really, at least to this point, fires, once you get above that red fir ecotone, aren't really burning any differently than they probably did historically. Um, Another thing, another application that I thought was a real cool one was from Mark Meyer, who published something this year in the Journal of Forestry looking at the effectiveness of wild and fire use, uh, or whatever it is we call it this, these days, I guess it's re fires managed for a variety of resource objectives. And he took uh, 17 fires that had burned, um, I forget the years, uh, but in, the, in, a, in a, uh, like a t 10 or 15 year period in the, two, in the 2000s. And then just compared the spectra of fire severity distributions versus a, a, an estimate that he got of natural range of variation that was to a great extent based on the mean outputs of a couple of BPS models that we developed. And it was a very cool paper because it showed that when we actually choose to let fires burn in upper elevation forests in the Sierra Nevada, they tend to reproduce the kinds of fire severity patterns that we want to see. Um, and then... Uh, there's uh, another application that we have been uh, working on with the University of Massachusetts, and that, uh, and I'm going to talk about that here, but um, just in general, you know, the BPS models can be plugged into spatial simulations, uh, and these allow you to generate much more realistic dynamics for disturbance on management landscapes. They also require that you know a whole lot more about your system, and they require that you be able to find a lot of spatial information that you don't need to actually just build the state and transition model. So, I mean, this work that we're doing on the Tahoe National Forest, just getting the models up and running took us nearly two years. Uh, and that's often not the kind of time that people have got uh, in management agencies. So this may be best done by people who've got some research time and some money. But uh, on this graphic, I've just got some examples here of models that can take state and transition models and then apply them uh, on spatial landscapes. Uh, TELSA from ESSA. There's Landsum from Bob Keene's lab. FireBGC, which was also from Keene's lab and, and working with some other folks. And then the Rocky Mountain Landscape Simulator, RM Lands, from Kevin McGarrigal at University of Massachusetts. So then referring to that last one, we uh, used RM lands, which was developed for actually for planning purposes in the Rocky Mountains, uh, to model uh, historic range of variation conditions in, a, in a, a sort of the northern half of the Tahoe National Forest, and then to uh, engineer management effects into the model so that we could see to what extent current proposals for restoration uh, could come close to uh, replicating the kinds of conditions in the landscape that we think uh, will be resilient to climate change. So the BPS models themselves provided the guts of the landscape model. Uh, we did make uh, modifications, right? We took some more recent reference information. Uh, we did change some of the transition probabilities based on that. Instead of having uh, two canopy cover levels, if you remember the model I showed you before, I think they were 
you know, before 40, uh, above 40 percent and below or something like that. We had canopy cover levels increase to three levels because the forest wanted to know the difference between sort of low, moderate, and high canopy cover. We split some of the models into uh, Zurich and Mesic versions, i.e. north slope, south slope. We did a lot of model validation and calibration uh, on these things. Again, this, this process took a couple of years just to get the model to where we're, we're actually running it now. And we allowed some transitions between models. In other words, that's one of the cool things you can do in a spatial model is you can plug in one of these state and transition models. And then you can say, all right, if you have this effect or if the climate warms this much, then this is going to transition into a totally different model because the dynamics are going to change. Or if you have an invasive species kind of come in and force it over a threshold. And those are the kind of things that you can actually link. So uh, in this case, this is uh, just a picture of the modeling landscape. And when you do uh, spatial models, one of the real, these kinds of spatial models in particular, one of the really important things you have to do is you have to have a buffer in the system. And so the lower left graphic shows the watershed, which was the north and middle fork of the Yubas, yeah, the Yuba River. And you can see that around that, there's a, I think it's a 10 kilometer buffer, something like that. Uh, and that is needed because, and this is the issue with the BPS models, is that they can't deal with things happening outside of, the, of what you're actually modeling, the, the cell that you're modeling. In other words, things outside of that cell can't affect it, or unless you fake it somehow, which you can do in, BP, in, in, in uh, VDDT. But you're going to have fires, for example, where, that begin from lightning ignitions that have, happen outside of the modeling landscape, and those are going to burn onto the landscape, and they're going to have effects. And so based on Kevin McGarrigal's experience, uh, we decided a 10-kilometer buffer was large enough such that the model could actually uh, incorporate simulated things going on in that buffer that would then impact things inside of the modeling area. So the model was carried out across that whole landscape, but the actual outputs and the summaries are just for the area in the dark boundary. So this is... Uh, one of the outputs, this is the grand mean fire return interval, which is equal to the fire rotation period, by the way. So in other words, fire return intervals are sort of local things. You know, how many times has this tree burned over some period of time? And, um, or how many years between the average, you know, fire for, this, uh, for, for a tree or a stand of trees? Whereas fire rotation period is a measure of, a landscape measure of fire frequency. Uh, how many years does it take for fires to to, to burn that whole landscape. Um, so when you see return interval in these graphics, they're referring here to fire rotation. And you can see that there was some very, very high fire frequencies in this landscape. And what you have to remember about most of the western U.S. is most of it hasn't seen a fire in 100 years. In fact, uh, Zach Steele and I did a uh, paper just the other day, yes, earlier this year, last year rather, um, where we found that about 75% of the mixed conifer in the uh, Sierra Nevada had not seen a single fire in over 100 years, which means they'd missed, if you're talking about fire return interval, of about 10 fires. Okay. Okay, so here is another example of, of how, when you do spatial modeling with these things, how your variability goes way up. And this is because of the impacts of things happening on cells outside of your modeling region. So uh, in, in the area that we modeled, we found that about 3.3% of the landscape experienced fire in an average year. As you can see, there were very few average years. Some years you had you know, hundreds of thousands of, of acres burning. Other years you had very little. And those were tied to wet and dry cycles as well. Uh, yeah, okay, here we go. Yeah, yeah. So basically, the average uh, landscape was seeing you know, the, the landscape was seeing about 15,000 acres on average of fire, whereas currently it's more it's only about one to two thousand acres if you include treatment and fire. Uh, again, this is just what this is. Is this is a a sort of a, a within the Sierra Mix conifer model that we built. These are the six different serial stages, or seven, one, two, three, or seven that we modeled, and you can see the variability that goes on in terms of the proportion of the overall landscape occupied by those. So this is kind of cool. You, it's definitely a really cool extension of the of the state and transition models, and then. What you can do with these models, and you can to an extent with the BPSs as well, like I showed in my first set of slides, is you can actually talk about 
you know, what was uh, the likely range of variation in this landscape before Euro-American settlement? Where are we right now? What can we do about it? And so to the right of that gray box, you can see that for late close, late moderate, and late open, we've got a range of variation. And then the yellow bar represents the current proportion of the landscape in those, uh, in those serial stages. And so there are some management recommendations in that box. Uh, and then so what we did was we took uh, treatment scenarios, a variety of different treatment scenarios from the district, um, uh, and we applied those actually. And then this is, this again took, boy, this was probably close to a year for the UMass people and for us to actually build the management uh, actions into the models, but we did that. And then we've actually run some, uh, some uh, tentative uh, outcomes from that, and what you can see is, the HRV scenario for this particular model is the blue, and you can see that after, I forget what it is, like 20 or 30 years of management, you can see that uh, the current landscape is very, very different, even though we were sort of, uh, in this particular case, operating at what we thought was a, a very a fast pace and a much larger scale than what they're currently doing. This isn't to cast aspersions on that district at all. This was just a scenario. Uh, and this is nice because then we can run other scenarios to see, you know, what we can actually do uh, to try to restore stands to a more, or forests to a more resilient condition. Note that this outcome didn't include uh, wildfire. So at any rate, in terms of conclusions, state and transition models are really, really useful tools. There's great literature out there on them. Uh, they they provide. So they, they, they provide you a much better understanding of the way succession and disturbance dynamics works in ecosystems. If you've got a model that you've built and you've validated it and you trusted it, boy, I'm telling you, you can, learn some, you can learn a lot of stuff real fast because you can dig into the model to find out what is actually going on in there that's creating the outcome you're seeing. You know, which serial state is it or what transition is it? Which transition do you have to change? Uh, which serial state do you need to actually manage? Uh, you, can, you, can, you can learn those sorts of things about ecosystems from these models. Um, it allows you to predict the outcomes of really complex ecosystem processes. This is one of the things about these models is a lot of what comes out is not predictable based on first principles because you've got all of these states and all these transitions happening. And by running the model, you can see stuff. You can get outcomes that you would not have predicted just thinking about the system. And then you can develop hypotheses of reference conditions to help guide management. So, just respect, with respect to the BPS models, a couple of things to note. They're pretty simple, all right, uh, but they have a lot of potential uses. I talked about some of the important assumptions and limitations. Um, most of these models were built by expert teams, and they were quality controlled, went through a couple different levels of review, but it's important that you understand that the level of validation in the models definitely varies, and it's particularly for um, vegetation types or ecosystems that are, are not uh, widely distributed and for which there has not been a uh, there hasn't been a lot of science done, you really need to look closely at those models. Uh, the ones that we really trust are the ones that we built, that we spent years building, and that apply to forests or vegetation types that have had a lot of research that we can apply and also can be adequately modeled in forest growth. Uh, uh, models like FES, for example. So it's important that you contact the model builders before using BPS, and you can find the metadata on the models on the Landfire website. And again, as I noted before, there is a review process underway right now, actually, um, and uh, any sort of expert input is welcome on this stuff. So. You can uh, use these to form the basis for local or regional modeling efforts as well. So you can modify them. You can include management actions. You can include climate change. You can include local conditions. Um, and we can help you if, if this is something you have interest in doing. We can certainly talk about it. We've used, it, at least with respect to the VDDT platform, we've used it a ton. And we understand pretty well how you can incorporate these sorts of things into the modeling. And then finally, as I noted, you can take these models and plug them into spatial models as well, and I think even improve their usefulness. Thanks a lot. So if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. There was one more conclusion slide. I think, Jeannie, if you wanted to talk about this. There are plenty of ways you can learn about land fire, as you all know. And I want to remind you of our web presence, and particularly the, the review site. Uh, the Land Fire Program home, landfire.gov. Conservation Gateway is Landfire's site on the Nature Conservancy's platform. We're on Twitter, 
uh, nature underscore land fire. We have a YouTube channel. We're currently building BPS tutorials, uh, among other things. Our webinar series are up there, understanding land fire. I mentioned at the beginning that we do have a bi-monthly bulletin we send out and occasional postcards. All of these are news only. So if you'd like to opt in, there's the URL, or shoot me an email at landfire at tnc.org if you want to ask about that, and I'll send you the, the opt-in, and we promise no spam, uh, only good information and connections. That email, landfire at tnc.org, and I'll remind you of the BPS Review website. Uh, just for your information, the TNC Landfire team has gone through the more than 1,500 models and descriptions, and we've cleaned them. We've removed duplicates and near duplicates and have cut the inventory almost in half. So after the cleaning now, they're posted up on the website. You'll have all kinds of directions on how to get involved there. Uh, I do want to let you know that no modeling is required, that we there's a four to ten page word document that is a description. and Reading those and providing commentary back to us is most helpful. That's what we're going to be working from until the end of June. So I'll remind you about landfirereview.org and email me at landfire.tnc.org if you need anything else. All right, this is for Hugh. Uh, Colin is wondering why you've chosen VDDT rather than the more recent STSIM software. Yeah, I mean, there's there's always new software coming out, right? And and VDDT is what we were used to. And remember that we built these models in, uh, I think, between about 2003 and 2005 originally, and then have recently changed them a little bit. Um, I'm actually not familiar with the software you're talking about, but they, you know, it may be that it provides some functionality that that VDDT didn't. We were very happy with it. There was a lot of stuff that went on there, and since the Forest Service was funding it. Uh, it kept getting updates based on our inputs, which was really, really cool. But that's really the only way I can answer that. And I, I just know that we got used to the VDDT platform. It was very easy to use, and they provided really, really great uh, support for the modeling. All right. So Rick says, as you noted, the distribution of serial stages in the BPS models has been proposed as a goal to manage for toward. You mentioned some incorporation of climate change effects to transition between models. One approach that's been proposed here is instead to aim for a distribution slightly more weighted to the older serial classes. Any thoughts of effectiveness of this or pitfalls to watch for? That was a great question. No, no worries on the typing there. Okay, great. Yeah, so I, well, obviously there are a bunch of different facets to this one. One is uh, the modeling side of things, and the model answer to that is that'd be easy. I mean, you would just simply incorporate, uh, you know, you would, you would use the model to try to uh, figure out what you could do management-wise to get more of those older serial states on there. You could also start the model with the older serial states using current conditions on the landscape. So you'd have to go in and change the transitions uh, to see how well you can maintain that thing on the landscape given things that are going on currently. But from the standpoint of uh, actually the climate change issues, um, which I guess is what you're answering, asking about. Yeah, I think the the, the main thing we're concerned about is, you know, uh, trying to keep carbon in trees. And the big trees tend to keep it better, particularly where the canopy isn't too dense and there aren't too many fuels in the ground. And I think that's the thing that when you use these models and other things to kind of do f a futuring, you realize that under probable California conditions in 50 to 100 years, it's going to be pretty darn unlikely that there's much going to be much in the way of dense forest out there anymore. Um, I just don't know how you maintain it. And, and that's not just, you, we see that not just from, I think, just through simple logic, but also these models make it really, really clear that it's going to be very, very difficult to do that. So I, maybe, Rick, you could qualify. I'm not sure. Are you talking about using the models somehow in this process, or was this just more like a management question? Okay, yeah. I got it. He says more of a management question, really, yeah. Well, and I would just say, since this is a, the modeling um, uh, uh, presentation, I think that um, the uh, you know these models can be used to do that kind of stuff, and they, they I think they can they can kind of lead you a little bit more robustly to decisions about this sort of stuff. I mean, for example, now again, I would recommend that 
really that you use a spatial model if you can at all do that. And this is where I think you, you, you can plug these state and transition models into these, and they're, and they're, they're a lot more valuable, I think, that way. But in terms of sort of broad landscapes, I think the state and transition models can be very useful that way, too, because what you'll see is uh, if you can properly characterize the states, uh, you can use a model like this to, to make assumptions about management and current conditions to see whether or not you can actually keep those kinds of states on the landscape long term and what it would actually take to do that. Um, I think that's actually uh, you know, exactly what uh, this kind of modeling is, is, is best set up to do.